Good evening. I am Xavier Solomon, the Deputy Director and Peter J. Sharp Chief Curator at the Frick Collection in New York. Happy New Year. Today, January 1st, we celebrate the beginning of 2021. And welcome to this first episode of 2021 of Cocktails with a Curator. We are used to toasting the new year with a glass of champagne, but today I'm toasting all of you with a Metropolitan, which is a cocktail made out of brandy and sweet vermouth with a dash of bitters. Happy New Year. Of course, we're all used to celebrating the beginning of a new year on the night between the 31st of December and the 1st of January at midnight. And even though at the end of 2020, this very strange, difficult year for all of us, uh, we haven't been able to do it in a way we would have liked to do it with a huge gathering in Times Square for us in New York, but gatherings all over the world with fireworks and great celebrations. Nonetheless, we still start a new year today with the hope of a better new year and a better future. It is worth remembering, however, that not all cultures and not all religions begin the year on the 1st of January. And of course, not all religions and cultures are celebrating the beginning of 2021. Different areas of the world calculate the year in different ways. And um, of course, for the Chinese or the Jewish um, culture or for the Muslim world, the year starts at a different point. We, of course, celebrate the 2021st birthday of uh, Jesus Christ as a Christian um, sort of culture. But of course, we have to understand that other cultures calculate the years in different ways and other cultures begin the new year in different times. And during history, these different times um, started calculating the year, uh, as I say, in a different way. So some cultures began the new year in March, at the beginning of March, on the 25th of March. Sometimes the new year begins with Easter for other Christian cultures. Uh, sometimes it's September 1st, sometimes it's December 25th, Christmas. In other cultures, the, the date is a moving date. And for example, for the Chinese New Year, is linked to the lunar um, cycles. So. It is a fixed date for most of us, but at the same time, we have to think of it as a somewhat relative date. And January 1st is the date of the new year, all the way back to the Julian calendar, which was established in the first century BC by Julius Caesar, a calendar which was the main calendar in the Western world all the way to the 16th century, when it was slightly adjusted and it became the Gregorian calendar uh, set up by Pope Gregory. And of course, other cultures remained uh, using the Julian calendar and um, only settled into the Gregorian calendar later on. But of course, it's worth thinking that um, time is somewhat uh, a recent uh, idea for us, and measuring time especially is, is, is a very recent uh, activity. We calculate the year and we divide the year into seasons and, and months and, and weeks and days, and we subdivide the days in, in hours and minutes and seconds, and we are very easily uh, used to that with watches and clocks and, of course, now with our cell phones. But that was not always the case, and it's clearly not the case in certain cultures. And we also have to think about how, in many ways, time is relative for us as, as human beings. So we all know about days that fly by very quickly and others that go very slowly. And you have to imagine that without a way to measure that time, uh, except from the solar um, structure of the day, sort of, you know, dawn and dusk and, and day and night, uh, many people around the world and in history uh, calculated time in very different ways. So today, because of the beginning of the new year, I would like to talk about a work of art at the Frick, uh, which is a great sculpture, but also a clock. And I would like to talk a little bit about the collection of clocks at the Frick and uh, some of these wonderful objects that help us measure time. This is a combination of two um, men working on this object. The sculptor who created the terracotta structure on which the clock is held is the French 18th century sculptor Claudion. 
And the clock itself, this wonderful mechanism englobed in this uh, glass sphere, is by the clockmaker of King Louis XV and King Louis XVI in, in France, Jean-Baptiste Leporte. And this was an object created around 1788. Um, Claudion, the sculptor who made this object, is uh, one of the most wonderful um, sculptors in 18th century France. Here you see him in a later portrait from the facade of the Louvre, but here you see him holding one of his terracotta sculptures. Claudion is actually the nickname of Claude Michel, and Claude Michel was born in 1738 in Nancy, in Lorraine, uh, in northeastern France. And he died in Paris in 1814, just on the eve of the fall of Napoleon. So like a number of other artists, like David and Fragonard, uh, he lives the, the span of time between the Ancien Regime, the French Revolution, well into uh, the Napoleonic period. And uh, Claudion is born um, from a family of sculptors. His father is a minor sculptor. His mother is related to uh, the Adam family, which uh, were a family of sculptors. And so in 1755, he moves from Nancy, from the north of France, to Paris, where he works first with his maternal uncle and then with one of the great sculptors of the time, Pigalle. Between 1762 and 1771, uh, Claudion, for almost a decade, is active in Rome. He travels to Rome, and there he studies antiquity. And of course, so much of Claudion's sculptures, as we will see, are uh, this wonderful combination of uh, antiquity, the inspiration of antiquity, and the French 18th century, and all the uh, elegance and fun of uh, the late 18th century in France. Claudion uh, works for a number of patrons in France, but he's a little bit like Fragonard um, in the sense that they're, they're exact contemporaries. And Fragonard is someone who very early on abandons all the sort of academic great commissions to focus on more private uh, work. And in the same way, Claudion has a very similar uh, type of patronage uh, that Fragonard has. And in many ways, he could be seen as the sculpture version of, uh, of Fragonard. He is connected to uh, to the sculptural world of, of France, of Paris, and so he uh, he marries the daughter of another um, of another sculptor, and he he marries the daughter of Pajou, and uh, he th this is a marriage, a very unhappy marriage, which ends up in divorce for the couple, and and Pajou's daughter marries someone else, divorcing them a second time. Uh, this is a portrait of Madame Claudion, as she was uh, as she then was. Uh, by La Bille Guillard, who was um, a French uh, uh, woman artist who did many portraits at the time. And this is now in the Louvre. Uh, Claudion's career, as I said, was uh, mostly in Paris, except from the decade in Rome. He was invited by Catherine the Great to move to St. Petersburg, but he never did so. Uh, he remains in Paris. And uh, he dies, as I say, at the eve of Waterloo and at the eve of the Restoration after uh, the Napoleonic period. His works are in, in metal, in, in, in stone, in marble, and in terracotta, but the terracottas are really the most famous uh, works by him, and they were very avidly collected in America at the end of the 19th and early 20th century. Uh, this is one that gives you a very good example of, of Claudion's work. Uh, it's a sat satire with a bacanti in the Philadelphia Museum, and most of Claudion's works are uh, erotic, uh, looking back to ancient figures, uh, but very much in this sort of sexy, typical 18th century, somewhat libertine fashion. And you can imagine that patrons, male patrons, obviously, would have particularly loved these sort of works in the houses. They're all fairly small, portable, that would have been placed on, on tabletops and, and chimney pieces. Uh, and they're very beautiful because of the rhythm of, their, of the movement of these figures and the way in which Claudion very poetically manages to capture the interaction of this male and female body in this case. That is also true of uh, the beautiful Claudion that Henry Clay Frick bought in 1915 uh, for the Fragonard Room. And this is where the, the, the sculpture usually is. Uh, this is a, um, a late, uh, latish work by, uh, by Claudion from 1799, and it shows Zephyrus and Flora. Of course, Zephyrus is the man on the right, the wind with these butterfly wings. Uh, 
who embraces Flora, the goddess of vegetation and flowers, and crowns her with a crown of flowers. And I particularly loved it when this sculpture was displayed uh, in the Portugal Gallery at the Frick, looking out to the um, flowering magnolia trees in the garden on Fifth Avenue. And of course, this idea of the wind and the flowers and the plants uh, embracing each other uh, is, is a wonderfully poetic idea, but also uh, works beautifully in this, in this small sculptural group by Claudion. Another favorite Claudion work in New York for me is this uh, sketch, this model for a monument which was never executed uh, in seven, around 1784. And it is the monument to the balloon. And in 1783, of course, the Montgolfier brothers uh, created the first balloon. It was the first time that man uh, flew in the sky with a balloon. And so the monument uh, was intended, there was a competition, and this is what Claudion proposed with a balloon at its top. And of course, the figure of fame and a number of putti and, and figures sort of uh, glorifying this uh, great technical invention. Unfortunately, this was never created, but I love the sketch uh, at the Met. And it just shows the invention and fantasy of an artist like Claudion. Now, our clock, um, as I mentioned, is uh, sculpted by Claudion in terms of the, the base of the clock, but then the clock was made by a celebrated clock maker at the French court. And it is worth talking a little bit about clocks because the Frick Collection has one of the most important clock collections uh, in the United States. Uh, Frick, of course, bought clocks for the house, and there are a number of, of clocks over mantelpieces and in various areas of the house that were bought by him before 1919 to decorate the house. This is probably the most important clock that Frick acquired, uh, this wonderful sort of long case clock uh, with bronze decorations by Caffieri. Um, and this was made by, uh, again, one of the great clockmakers in France at the time. And it's usually at the end of the staircase that connects the first and second floor at the Frick. Um, but most of the clocks that arrived at the Frick arrived later on with the gift of a man called um, Winthrop Kellogg Eady. Uh, he was born in 1938 and died in 1999, and after his death, his great collection of clocks came to us at the Frigg. He was a great expert and in clocks and, and watches and a famous society figure in New York in the 20th century. And um, I, I love this sort of juxtaposition between his serious uh, pursuit of, uh, of clocks and watches and his writings about them and his knowledge on them, and then his life in other circles of artistic uh, life in New York. He was particularly close to Andy Warhol and uh, Robert Mapplethorpe, and um, he was one of the models uh, of some of the um, screen tests that, uh, that Andy Warhol produced and he was also um, providing his apartment for some of these to be filmed uh, by Warhol. And here you see him in, 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 in one of them. And of course, this uh, sort of combination is, is sort of typically uh, New York-like, and, and I particularly love that as, as an idea. And uh, Kellogidi ended up uh, curating an exhibition on French clocks at the Frick between 1982 and 1983, and as I said, donating his collection to the museum. And here I just want to give you a very brief um, series of examples of some of these clocks that came to us. Uh, some are very rare early examples. This is a French clock from the 1530s, a very rare example of this type of object. And here is a German one from about 20 years later. This is in the 1550s. Uh, one of the most splendid examples is this Weber, Weber clock um, made in, in Augsburg uh, a century later in the 1650s. Uh, and then, of course, the grandest example of the uh, ED collection is this Boule barometer clock made between 1699 and 1700 in France. And of course, Boulle, the great cabinet maker, uh, designs this clock with Egyptian um, with Egyptian detail. So you have the sphinxes and a number of little Egyptian designs uh, in it. And this is a spectacular grand object uh, from the ED collection. But of course, there are also watches. And some of the watches are beautifully elegant. And this I particularly love. Uh, it's a Breguet watch from around 1820. Very simple and elegant. And of course, uh, we have to think that all the way till 
pretty much the 19th century, uh, clocks in houses were the only way to keep time. And of course, they would have only been in uh, rich households. While the idea of a pocket watch was something that really begins in the 19th century mainly, and then expands to the idea of sort of you know, everyone having a timekeeping instrument on them. And of course, the fact that now we're all used to having a watch and, and, and calculate time very easily. All of these watches, plus others from other private collections, were brought together at the Frick in 2014 in an exhibition about clocks. And of course, if you want to know more about this, the ED collection and this, this exhibition, uh, we have a series of uh, lectures and material around them uh, on our website under the exhibition uh, page. But the clock I'm talking about today uh, is not part of the ED bequest. As I say, it was acquired in 2006, but it was acquired with funds from the ED bequest to acquire further watches and clocks. So he also left uh, a, a, a sum of money so that we could continue um, building on the collection that he had so generously given. The clock is extraordinary in itself, is this visible mechanism, it's a great um, feat of technology, uh, and it is also enclosed in this uh, glass dome, which again, for us, it seems today as a very simple object, but of course would have been technically very difficult to achieve and create with this perfection, uh, both the mechanism and the glass uh, in, um, in the, at the end of the 18th century. And uh, what is extraordinary about this is that uh, the glass of the, of, the, of, the, of the clock is still the original one. So it's a very, very fragile and very important object. The figures below are uh, three female figures, obviously based on antiquity. Think back to the Zephyrus and Flora and the Bacchante and the Satire in, in Philadelphia and the other group at the Frick. Uh, these all look back to the Roman prototypes that... Um, that uh, Claudion would have seen in Rome. And this is uh, the dance of time. Uh, we don't know what these three figures represent exactly, who they are, if they are nymphs or if they are hours. So there are obviously representations of the hours and there is this long tradition of the dance of the hours uh, in the Western world. But clearly they're dancing around the, 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 the clock to point out the cyclical nature of time and this idea that even though the seasons change, there is a regular uh, alternation of seasons and in the same way, like a clock or a watch works during the day through the 24 hours, you always go back in a way where you started. Now, this is a Western tradition that goes back a long way, but the most classical example and one that I, I particularly love is this painting by Poussin, uh, The Dance to the Music of Time in the Wallace Collection. And this is a painting painted around uh, 1636 uh, for Cardinal Rospigliosi, who later became Pope Clement IX. And again, it shows time on the right, the old man playing an instrument. And there are various references to time, the little boy on the left blowing bubbles, which of course, like time, they fleet away, and the other boy with the hourglass, of course, the hourglass being a different way of measuring time uh, that existed before the technology and the mechanism of clocks and watches was uh, was perfected. And you have these four figures, just like the Claudion clock, dancing to the music of time, dancing to uh, to time. And of course, these are four, so they probably represent uh, the four seasons. Well, of course, in our clock, uh, there are only three. And at the top, you get Apollo with the chariot of the sun. And of course, the hours and time during the day for us human beings is, is calculated from because of the course of the sun and the, the way the sun uh, divides day and night. Now, this is a, a celebrated painting. And of course, uh, just to have an aside in literature, uh, it was such so well known in England that Anthony Powell wrote his monumental novel, A Dance to the Music of Time, in four movements uh, between 1951 and 1975. And it is um, a wonderful book about the passing of time and, and different generations uh, of a group of people in British society. And of course, not uh, by coincidence, the, the books here that you see have details of the Poussin painting and the Wallace collection on their cover. 
So back to our, our clock, uh, this tradition of the dance to the music of time, it's something that goes back not only to Poussin, but even before that. And clearly Claudion and Leporte uh, came up with this idea. Uh, the clock was made for an architect. The, the, the first owner of this clock was the architect Alexandre Théodore Brognard. And um, I like the idea that this was also made for an architect. So the idea of the sort of measuring of time and the idea of these sort of figures um, in a way dancing around time sort of makes sense for someone who is designing also space and is, and is creating a bu buildings. And I, I sort of particularly um, love that idea. And so I thought this would be an appropriate object to begin uh, 2021 with. And uh, once we move to Frick Madison, and once we're going to be open there in the next few months, we will have some small sections of, of clocks and, and, and watches, and you will be able to see some of these works uh, on view there. But then, of course, back at 1East 70th Street, uh, many more of them will be, will be visible. Uh, so I would like to toast once again to the new year, to 2021, and I would like to wish you all uh, a very happy new year, and I hope this new year will be full of everything you all wish for. Cheers.